Good evening all. I would like to welcome all the participants for this one of the most important and required topic at this current point of time. On behalf of IMA, JD and Tamil Nadu and Medusin, I would like to welcome all the participants. I would like to thank Dr. Vengdesh Karthikeyan sir, uh, who is the General Secretary of IMA, JD and Tamil Nadu for giving us this opportunity to combine and do this session uh, with them. Thank you so much, sir. And I would also like to thank today's speaker, our Dr. Pratik Joshi, sir, one of the long-time associate of medicine, and he is also one of the ortho faculty of our medicine forum. Thank you thank so you. much, sir, for joining with us. Dr. Pratik Joshi, sir, is associate fellow of American College of Surgeon and also assistant professor of orthopedics from BJ Government Medical College, Pune. And sir is also going to join in Rington Hospital, Greater Manchester, United Kingdom, as an orthopedic surgeon um, coming weeks. I would like to thank you, sir, for uh, taking us your time on this busy schedule and coming uh, to help us in deciding Swadeshi or Videshi, that is whether to be in India or to go to abroad, not only for your IS studies, also to discuss about the opportunities after completing your MBBS or your PG. Thank you so much, sir. In fact, sir is mastermind behind this session. When I asked him uh, to do some kind of session as uh, for our younger medicos as well as for the junior doctors across our state as well as across the country. He has a huge experience in traumatology, surgery, pelvic surgery, and he is also a certified advanced trauma life support provider. He has various publications and also participated and organized various national and international conferences. He has also contributed a complete ortho clinical series for undergraduate students in our own YouTube uh, channel. Thank you so much, sir, for always guiding us and also always being in support with us. Now, I would like to hand over the session to sir to guide us and help us in deciding our future career. Thank you so much, sir, on behalf of IMA, JD, and Tamil Nadu, as well as Medusi. Okay. Thank you, Raghu, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And first of all, of course, uh, thanks to entire team medicine, uh, team IMA, JD, and Tamil Nadu, and uh, the entire uh, to Devalina and team Clinic for putting across this session to uh, a lot of people across the country. It's a real pleasure to be here. Now, um, basically, this kind of a session is not just a uh, I'm not trying to spark a debate on uh, who wants to go where or who's supposed to do what. Um, this is also not my way of uh, propagating what I'm trying to do. It's basically what I would like to do is I would like to take you through my uh, journey throughout the medical career so far and how I um, started off from being someone who was very deep into the Indian system. And then uh, at a certain point in my career, I decided to take a plunge into going abroad. So uh, I'll take you through the entire process. And uh, hopefully at the end of the session, we will have approximately 15 to 20 minutes for question and answers. Please feel free to enter your question and answers uh, into the chat box. And um, once the question answers reach us, Raghu and I will uh, deal with it in the form of a panel discussion. So thank you again for having me here. I'm gonna switch off my video now and I'm going to continue by sharing my screen. So let us start off on this session. And here we go. So uh, here we are, uh, Dr. Raghu, can you just confirm if the PowerPoint is visible so that I can start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, the PowerPoint is visible. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone, and greetings from BJ Medical College Pune. This is my alma mater, and this is the institute which brought me up from a uh, first MBBS kid to a uh, uh, master's degree holder in orthopedics and an assistant professor, and pretty much everything that I have done so far. This is where I grew up, and this is the institute which I'm proud to call my home. So greetings from Pune and uh, today's session is, as we said, Swadeshi versus Videshi, that is India versus foreign career opportunity. Although in this particular set, uh, title, I have said that there are opportunities for Indian graduates, it doesn't just uh, restrict us to post MBBS people alone. I'm sure we have a lot of students who are in different stages of MBBS listening into this talk. And I'm sure there will be something that you can take home from this session. So uh, that being said, my name is Dr. Pratik Joshi. 
and a little bit about me before we start the session. So I completed my MBBS and my Master of Surgery, that is MS Orthopedics from Bija Medical College and Sassoon General Hospitals in Pune. And uh, a year later, I also finished my DND, that is Diploma of National Board of Orthopedics from the National Board of Examinations in Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And currently I'm working as an Assistant Professor of Orthopedics at Bija Government Medical College and Sassoon General Hospitals in Pune. I am a certified instructor from the advanced. Um, I'm a certified instructor with the advanced trauma life support from the American College of Surgeons, USA. And uh, yeah, I just got a request to start the video. I will start in a minute or so until I uh, finish reading this slide. So I'm an instructor with the advanced trauma life support with the American College of Surgeons, USA. And at the same time, I have also certified my or I finished my certification in basic surgical skills and care of the critically ill surgical patient or CCRISP with Royal College of Surgeons, London, United Kingdom. I have done a couple of observations here and there, one in Tata Memorial Hospital, Lower Parade, Mumbai for musculoskeletal oncology and a similar one at Guys and St. Thomas NHS Foundation Trust Hospital and King's College in London. I, as of today, I am a university approved undergraduate teacher from the Maharashtra University of Health Sciences, Nashik. And I had the opportunity to be a co guide for the ICMR short term studentship 2022 in the Department of Orthopedics. Now, that being said, uh, I'm starting my video again. I hope it is visible. And let us go on to the rest of the PowerPoint. So, as I said, this is not just a, uh, some kind of um, uh, marketing for where I'm going to the UK, which is writing in Big Kim and Lay, NHS Foundation Trust Hospitals in Greater Manchester. But this is my journey as to what I did until this point and how I was able to weigh the options and the different kinds of pathways which life gave. So I started, as I said, at BJ Medical College at Sassoon General Hospital Pune. And um, 10 years can make a huge difference, not just in my hairline, which is receded over here, but starting from a... Um, very uh, cheerful, bubbly first MBBS student to an equally cheerful um, assistant professor, but with a difference of two degrees and a lot of experience and a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, exposure, which I got. And uh, of course, this is somewhere where we have um, a lot of patient exposure. Orthopedics has always been a branch where um, we have good amount of patient contact and a wide variety of cases. And I was very lucky to have a crazy three years of residency at the same institute. So at the end of that, where I stand is at an institute where service, duty and sacrifice is what is written on the logo or on the masthead of our institute. And this is our group of um, doctors. We were approximately 30 of us. Some of them are not in the picture. So uh, we were approximately 30 of us when the service actually called for us. And this was in 2019. Anyone who is from Maharashtra is familiar with the city called Kolhapur. And we had a lot of floods and uh, human and property damage in August 2019 in Kolhapur because of the untimely rains. And uh, this is the team BJ Medical College Pune who had gone there as a flood relief operations or uh, the disaster management kind of an operation. And uh, this is the city of Kolhapur at the time of the floods and the road that we are going on is State Highway 134, which is uh, Kolhapur, which is reduced to such a small road because of the entire city being waterlogged or flooded. And this is when um, you actually feel that the years of medical training which you have had, which helped you to be sympathetic and empathetic and compassionate and so on and so forth. These are being put to use. And um, at this particular point in time, I was uh, not really considering any foreign option because I was looking at a lifetime of um, a career in the Indian setup. But and then I also had the opportunity to experience a good two months at Guys in St. Thomas NHS Foundation Trust Hospital. And it was an observership in cold orthopedics and musculoskeletal oncology. And that is when I realized or something which horizon, which widened my horizons and which made me really think about what else I can do and where else I can go. So that is where I started considering my options. And that is where a whole new world opened up to me. 
and that's bringing in our uh, topic for this afternoon, which is our uh, comparison between the Indian and the, uh, foreign options as far as career is concerned. Now, here what we have is, of course, our traditional training route in India. Traditional training route in India is that we have a sort of a non dichotomized or a monopolized training route in India where you will have a exam which decides where you're going to go and what you're going to do. And then you join in in a particular system. For example, through your NEET PG, you can join in into a set of government and uh, non-government medical colleges. And you will start your three years of a master's, be it an MS being in surgical sciences or be it an MD being in the uh, medical stream. And you will go through your three years, finish your MD or your MS and get your degree. Followed by that, of course, you will have the option in order to go over and above and finish your super specialization, or you may have the option of entering your private practice. You can also have, of course, the option of settling into your institute and joining in, be it if it's a government institute, you can slowly and steadily rise up the hierarchy and you can uh, rise up the ranks to become an assistant professor, an associate professor, and then so long and so forth, you go on to the professor in the administrative side, such as superintendent or dean or things like that. They are excellent jobs and the uh, there is a lot of responsibility to be held in these kinds of posts. The human contact of these posts is a lot and you really get to serve society in a very good fashion. Then the next option by a lot, taken by a lot of people is something called the INICET. So that is your Institutes of National Importance. So um, back in the day when I was giving my uh, NEET postgraduate entrance, at that time, uh, we used to have a separate entrance exam for each of these particular uh, institutes. So uh, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences had its own entrance exam, as did the Postgraduate Institute PGI in or Chandigarh and so on and so forth. Nowadays, all of them have been clubbed into one single entrance examination, which is your INICET. The INICET, of course, gets you the same MS or MD degree in an institute of national importance, which is run by the central government. They are very high academic institutes and uh, they have a lot of potential to rise higher up in your career as well. The third, of course, option is uh, something which we can basically spend another session on, and that is DMD versus the MDMS now, which is better and why? So it's not a, a lot of point in going into detail into uh, this particular discourse in this lecture because what we are here for this evening is something entirely different. But uh, DMB and MS now are in the entire uh, schedule one of the NCI, which is the institutional degrees which are awarded by institutions in India and are recognized by the NMC. So for all practical purposes, that makes DNB and MS at the same level. There are of course differences based on the institutes from which you do your thing and of course differences based on the branches in which you are uh, planning to get. But at the same time, DNB is slowly and steadily becoming as well recognized and as well accepted as your MD and MS. Of course, there are uh, the, some kinds of advantages and disadvantages to this uh, training route, which is the Indian training route. On one hand, um, in terms of advantages, what we have is that it is a very mainstream training route, which means you will have no dearth of coaching institutions, you will have no dearth of knowledge available on the internet, you will have no dearth of finding study partners and like-minded people, and there will always be someone or the other around who is following the same route. So. Uh, a lot of the knowledge about this in terms of technical matters, in terms of eligibility and so on and so forth is freely available on the internet and it is easily accessible. And therefore, it does not feel like a shot in the dark. But the disadvantage of this is that there is a lot of competition. There are uh, many lakh students who are giving the exam and beyond a rank of approximately 10,000, uh, it is a little difficult to get the institute which you like or the branch which you like. Unless you are incredibly lucky, uh, it's a little difficult and therefore the odds are not in your favor. We have an approximate um, 8 or 9 percent final selection rate across all branches and across all uh, centers. So it's a little difficult. 
Another advantage of this is that it is a quick entry into the MDMS. It is a shorter course. And uh, as we have been hearing from a lot of people, the training durations in India are a little um, shorter as compared to training durations abroad. Now, this is another sort of a myth or a misunderstanding, which we will get to in a while. But for the time being, we can take it as an advantage. And on the other hand, uh, in terms of disadvantages, with the number of medical colleges and the number of training institutes which are coming up, MD, MS, DNB, all of these degrees are now a little mainstream. And uh, all major branches, especially the broad specialty branches, are facing a very big problem in India. That is called a saturation. So uh, if the saturation is a lot, especially in the larger cities, especially in the uh, cities which have a lot of um, uh, large metropolitan population and a lot of uh, government effort to put up new hospitals, uh, saturation is a little less in the peripheries of these cities and in the rural areas. So it is a mixed bag, no doubt, with its own advantages and disadvantages. So moving on, now um, a little quick brief about the training routes in the United Kingdom. I would like to thank my senior, Dr. Yadmik Jatha, sir, who is MBBS, MS Ortho, and member of Royal College of Surgeons, United Kingdom, for uh, his help with these slides. And um, he was one of the reasons that I had a lot of clarity while I was going through this journey. So thank you very much, sir. And a uh, few of the slides from this PowerPoint are also from a similar talk, which I have been given by sir. It is absolute gold standard material. So in the UK, what we have is basically a longer pathway where you finish your MBBS and you join what is called as a foundation year or a foundation year, which is equivalent to the internship, which we are doing here. So foundation year or an internship, that is an FY1 or an FY2. Followed by that, what we go into is called as your core training. Now, core training is something which is reserved for medical branches. The same one or two years is referred to as surgical training or ST, one, two, in the case of surgical branches. It is the same status in your life. It is just a different name. And it is the equivalent of your JR1 ship or your JR2 ship. That is the first two years of your professional experience. Followed by that, you are expected to finish your MRCP or your MRCS examination at this stage. Once you're clear with that, what you get is into your ST3, that is your specialty training, years three to eight. Now, specialty training is something which is basically the equivalent of being an assistant professor here in India. If you, anyone is uh, listening from the uh, central government institutes, you must be aware that there is a three years of junior residency followed by three years of senior residency and two or three years of being an assistant professor before you can become a consultant or a professor. So it is exactly the same in the ST3 to ST8, which is a duration of five years where you are into your specialty training at the end of which you are expected to have finished your FRCP, that is your Fellowship of Royal College of Physicians for the medical branch people. And the Fellowship of Royal College of Surgeons, that is your FRCS for the surgical branch people. And at the end of it, you will become a consultant after you have done this CCP, which is a completion of clinical training, which means you have done all of this. So now you can be called as a consultant. Now, on Prime of Pessy, it may appear that the um, route is very long and you may be putting in a lot of your time into this but if you were to calculate from your start of MBBS you will realize that the amount of time taken is exactly the same as it is taken in a central government institute to become this assistant or associate professor that is a consultant level person and so this is a parallel training route which is there in the United Kingdom. Moving on now of course if you were to um, look for a career in the UK, you would like to deal with three major agencies. Number one is the first and foremost, which is the GMC or the General Medical Council, which is the equivalent of the National Medical Commission or NMC here in India. Followed by that, you also have to prove your uh, English language efficiency. That is the 
IELTS, which is the International English Language Testing System, or the OET, which is the Occupational English Test. And lastly, once you are done with these two and you have an offer letter, you have to deal with the UKVI, which is the UK Visas and Immigration Authority, who will allow you to enter the country. So these are the three agencies with which you will be dealing when you are looking for a career in the UK. Now, of course, there are three groups for GMC registration. So the crux or the underlying highlight of this slide is that without a registration with the GMC, you are not eligible to work as a doctor in the UK. So you must start off with a GMC registration. So we can use the GMC registration. We can use one of these three pathways. One is called as the PLAB or it is the Professional and Linguistic Assessment Board, PLAB. The second one is a Royal College membership exam. That's a member of Royal College of Surgeons or member of Royal College of Physicians or we can go via the MPI route, that is sponsorship. So we will go into a little bit of detail about this one slide per topic so that we get an idea of what exactly is going on. But what does not change is the fact that you have to be GMC registered in order to be a doctor in the UK. Moving on, of course, IELTS and OET, there are two groups which can be given and each of them has a different set of the difficulty level and each of them has a different kind of a uh, profile. What you require as a doctor to be in the UK is something which is called as the IELTS academic. We are into a training course and therefore not a general training module but an academic module is what you have to pass with a decent band score in order to get into the UK. Followed by that, here are the two types of visas which we will be dealing with. Now, these are the, there are different five types of visas out of which as a university student, you may be eligible for something which is a tier four student visa. And later on, you may be eligible for a tier two, that is a skilled worker visa. So the visa will be either a tier four or a tier two visa. In some very rare cases for short term training courses, you may utilize tier five kind of a visa. So tier two, tier four and tier five are the three types of visas out of which you will have to uh, apply for one in order to go to the UK. And so we have to be some kind of a member of one of the four royal colleges. Now all the four royal colleges are spread across the length and breadth of the UK and they are equal in all standings. They conduct the exam which is done by the exam conducting board and a membership of one of these colleges is recognized across the UK. So there is Royal College of Surgeons of England, Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh which is in Scotland, another one in Glasgow and another one in Ireland. Now one of these four colleges will be your college which will grant you your membership. There is an exam called the MRCS or the MRCP. We will talk about it in some time and that will be your entry exam. So as we said, out of the three routes, one of them was the Royal College membership exams. So this was the route. The first route that we are now discussing is called as a PLAB. The PLAB is the Professional and Linguistic Assessment Board, which is a MCQ and an OSCE pattern. The ideal time for MBBS graduates, internship is the best time to finish your PLAB 1. And after finishing your internship or after finishing your one year of MBBS, with less than a year of experience, PLAB 2. And it will let you enter at the FY1 or FY2 level of the training hierarchy, which is also the training pay scale in the UK. Moving on, the essential requirements of the PLAB are an acceptable primary medical qualification or the PMQ, which is something which you can find out if your MBBS granted by your college or your university is the accepted to the UK. Uh, on the government.uk, gov.uk website, you will find out a list of the entire uh, set of medical colleges in every country, which 
are recognized or whose MBBS degree is recognized. Majority of medical colleges in our country are recognized. And the best thing to do is go on the government website and see how um, see that your college is there on that list. What you also require is a good score in the IRBS academic module, which is a band 7.5 with a 12 months of clinical experience at a teaching hospital, which means a good completion of internship. And of course, the GMC online account, which will be something which you can start once you are done with your internship. The second route to going is the membership of Royal Colleges. That is the MRCP for medical branches, the MRCS for surgical branches. Some specific colleges like MRCPCH for pediatrics, MRCP Psych for Psychiatry or MRCOG for Oxfam. It will let you enter at a slightly higher level on the pay scale, that is ST1 or ST2 equivalent and above. And again, MRCS has two parts, that is a part one, which is MCQ, and a part two, which is OSCE. And some parts have, some branches will have part three and more. For example, MRCOG has three parts, and MRCP has part three and then PACES as well. Moving on, we have the third route, which is the medical training initiative. Now, this is something which is not really applicable to MBBS graduates. It is for someone who has a few years of specialty experience. So if we have any postgraduate students or young faculty, someone who is uh, roughly my uh, level in the uh, system who is listening, medical training initiative is applicable to someone like that who has a few years of specialty experience. It is also called as a sponsorship route, which means that your GMC registration and your uh, UK visa will be sponsored by the uh, hiring trust. Remember, sponsored does not refer to a monetary sponsorship. Sponsored refers to then issuing you a certificate of sponsorship, which means they will vouch for your GMC registration and therefore they will be responsible for getting your GMC registration done. Prerequisites, of course, they require a few years of professional experience, a good CV with a good number of uh, curricular and extracurricular activities, some publications. There is always an MPI interview in which uh, questions are asked about your branch and about the uh, things that you have done and also a little bit about your knowledge of the NHS and most importantly not all the posts which are advertised are available to be filled via the MPI so availability of a relevant post is also a prerequisite for the MPI. Pros of this are that it is a fast track entry uh, into the system for someone who wants to get there quick and it gives you a permanent GMC registration. On the other hand MPI has a lot of competition since it is a route which anyone with the requisite experience can apply and therefore proportional to the competition there is a relatively low selection rate and once you are selected through MPI it is difficult to get selected again and therefore it is for mainly for those people who want to spend say a year or two abroad before coming back to their home country. Not all the MPI posts may be on a tier 2 visa you may have a slightly lower tier, that is a tier 5 visa, which will be given to you. So another system which is a mixed bag and to be taken depending on the circumstances of the person who is applying to it. Now, the main difference which I have found between the Indian system and the system abroad is that the exams are a test of competence and not a test of excellence. So what we have over here, in the case of the PLAB or the MRCS, there is no ranking. There is no one who has a rank one in the MRCS or a rank five. What is said is a minimum uh, percentile, which is the passing mark, which is generally 70 percentile or 75 percentile or something like that. And whoever is able to clear that particular score is declared pass. So you have to prove your competence to clear the percentile. The selection rates are, uh, although it sounds very simple, the selection rates are approximately 25%. But at the same time, it is something which you have to demonstrate your competence, both theoretical as well as clinical, in order to be selected. So one of the things which you will require, I digress a bit, but I think I can take a few minutes off in this session, 
to talk about CV building because what you do require for any uh, application abroad, be it going through your flat or be it going through your MRCS, the selection is uh, quite dependent on what you have done in your life so far. So what you must have in your CV is a set of these things. Number one is the employment history, which means what all you have done in your professional career in reverse chronological order, followed by that a set of awards or prizes, whatever awards, citations and other things which you have received. Then audits and presentations, which is your uh, clinical research, which you have done, all of that in the chronological fashion. Any other courses which you have done, that is your, uh, be it your ATLS or your ACLS, or be it some sort of a thesis writing for some academic research, literature, workshop, so on and so forth. And lastly, any and all of your research which has gone to print, which is a set of publications. So if anyone is interested or anyone has doubts about CV building, of course, I will be uh, putting out my contact details on the last slide of this PowerPoint. So uh, of course, you can feel free to get in touch and we can talk more about this CV building and uh, anything else that you may require. So the question is, where do you fit in? Or seeming so that the lab and the MRCS or the MRCP are kind of parallel, who fits in where? So post MBBS, a good time to join in the system will be an FY3 and then to proceed to your CTE and ST phases. And so if you're just a post MBBS student, fresh out of the grill, then a lab is a good option for you. If you are post residency, that is you have a couple of options, open to you after having completed your residency, you can go in for your MRCP or your MRCS, go into a training job and then go via a CESR route and become a consultant. If you're looking for a short-term training, the MPI is also an option for you. Moving on, of course, why the UK? Now, this is again, not a marketing uh, strategy, but this is something which resonated with me. This is why I felt that UK was a nice place for me to go. Number one is that it is a very stratified training, which means that everything runs on an SOP and everything runs on a protocol. And therefore, you have the entire medical system, which is very, very protocol based and very, very stratified. Moving on, the entire protocols are, of course, not just a conjecture or a, a means of someone's imagination, but they are very much evidence based and based on genuine research. And most importantly, for an Indian medical graduate who is going abroad and looking for abroad opportunities, there are always opportunities to enter surgical fields, which may be a little difficult in other exams, such as the USM or any other countries which you may plan. UK is more welcoming to Indian graduates, and it is a very good place to learn and hone your skills when it comes to the sort of these training jobs. And of course, as someone on the internet has said, if you're in the UK and you are not enjoying London, then you are not in the UK. So a lot of uh, non-academic benefits of being in a nice place. There's a lot of place uh, to travel and there is a lot of place to explore the world, which you would love to do while we are in the age of traveling and exploring the world. And this is the kind of uh, things that you see in London on a uh, uh, standard evening and it's a lot of good architecture and a lot of nice walkable so to say instagramable locations although this is not the first thing we would think of but surely it pays to be working in a nice place where you look forward to going over there. also a few more things uh, something which has been implemented extensively and completely across the uk is something called as the ewtd which is the european working time directive so European Working Time Directive states that doctors will work for only 40 hours a week at maximum and including overtime, only 72 hours a week. And the overtime is a, a opt-in kind of an overtime where you can ask for overtime. It is not something which is given to you. You also have a good amount of annual leaves and study leaves and sick leaves with a decent income and a free health care. For those who are looking to settle abroad, it's an easy settlement in about six or seven years. And of course, proximity to Europe. If for those who are 
uh, interested in going to Europe for a few short courses or to learn or to work or to travel and explore. And lastly, you will never feel alone because there is a lot of Indian diaspora in the UK and therefore it is never a big um, jump from home. A little bit of homesickness, of course, can be expected. But at the same time, there is no uh, feeling of being in an alien land. And of course, the most important part is that a lot of this information which I am talking about and details about anything and everything that I have spoken about is available on Google. It is entirely transparent and open source information which you can find anywhere. And so Google is your best friend when it comes to doing research. And therefore, when you are researching about this topic, go ahead, read on the official websites and a lot of information will be available to you. A little bit of um, what was uh, what I went through in the past year, of course, uh, it's been a difficult two years for everybody. And uh, I was lined up to go to uh, two very high volume centers in India in order to pursue arthroplasty, which is my area of interest. But however, the COVID um, pandemic caused me to cancel both of those and of course, stay in the parent institute, which I am in right now. And uh, of course, it was quite a setback and uh, no doubt it, our profession is about taking setbacks as and when they come and then recovering from them and standing up stronger. So there may be times of frustration and of course, there may be some kind of a uh, new road which opens after the setback. What I learned from my setbacks was that uh, always look for a bigger, better deal. Never be afraid to seek new horizons or to change your plans. And most importantly, never put all your eggs in one basket. So it may seem that you are in a uh, place where there is a lot of conundrum and you know, there's a lot of uh, thought process going on, but it's all a part of the plan. And uh, God puts us on the right track whenever we are in a mental dilemma. So that being said, I hope you like this little informative session about the training groups and the ways to get into the UK. My uh, contact info is here. This is my Gmail ID. This is the Instagram handle. And this is my uh, mobile number for uh, queries. And here we have four websites which give a lot of information. One of them is called Message Journey. The other one is called Road to UK. Third one is called BDI Resourcing. And the fourth one is, of course, the official GMC website, which is gmc-uk.org. So this was our session, and uh, I again thank Raghunandan Ramanathan from uh, the entire Medusane team and the team of uh, IMA JD and Tamil Nadu for hosting this session. So Raghu, I hand over to you now. Let us see if we have any doubts. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, is there any doubts in the chat box? Uh, no, sir, I have not received any question yet. Okay. So if you have any doubts, you can just put down in the chat box. I'll just give you a minute time. If you have any, have anyone have any doubt, you can just put down in the chat box. And uh, if at all, if you don't want to open up, you can also message me or uh, you can also mail sir directly. If you have yes, any doubts definitely. or any queries in future, we will be happy to help you out. Definitely, and yes. you, you would have also seen various videos, various uh, lectures by Sir in our YouTube channel. You are always free to utilize those videos and it will be very useful for your final year because as a final year student, myself uh, learned a lot from those uh, lectures. So you can also use that and you can just get benefited out of it. And regarding uh, your can even about the entrance exam that is NEET, uh, sir has given a very beautiful uh, explanation in our same YouTube channel. As well, we have a separate YouTube channel for Sir too. You can also visit that and you can also see those uh, videos. There are uh, even we have done a workshop on uh, trauma life support in our own YouTube channel, uh, which is conducted as an hands on session by Pratik Joshi Sir in uh, BJ Medical College. You can also see that when you have time. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, spending your time and giving us a beautiful explanation. And uh, most importantly, uh, like various confusion when we are about the MRCP exams and when to appear that and how to crack that too. 
we will also be happy when in future if you also share uh, uh, on the pattern of mrcp exam because we we many people ask that doubt like uh, how to attend that session what is the pattern of the mrcp exam and how uh, usually it will be so that uh, yeah. if you have you that can would also be nice hopefully by say the same time next year also i should be in a position to talk about that so just hoping for the best and fingers crossed yes sir yes sir thank you so much sir and uh, uh, just one doubt sir regarding the uh, plab exam and mrs is, is like uh, as you told the best time to do is like we have a separate timeline but yes. uh, can uh, after completing mbbs uh, can a person even write mrcp though the plab is better one yes yes definitely definitely you can and uh, there the eligibility for mrcp or mrcs for surgical branches is mbbs graduate so you can definitely write the mrcs nothing wrong with that and uh, it will be a slightly difficult exam from what we are used to but uh, there are many many people who have cleared the mrcp and mrcs after mbbs alone and they also join in on the uh, pathway over there so definitely mrcp mrcs can be given after mbbs as well yes okay so i have received one question from the in the whatsapp sir like uh, why what is the difference between like uh, many time people get confused with this frcp fellowship uh, as well as mrcp that is uh, uh, this one so what is the yeah. difference like a uh, few people think after mbbs we can do frcs or frcp directly so is there a option or a, what is the exact difference see uh, frcp or frcs the fellowship exam is a higher level exam than the mrcp so in most cases you cannot give the fr exam without giving an mr exam so it uh, generally what happens is that what you go if you enter the training by clearing your mrcp or mrcs go through the entire training and then finish your training by clearing the frcp so it's like an entry exam and an exit exam so there are some cases where you can just give the frcp but the, or frcs but that is just for the degree it does not confer you a gnc registration or it does not give you a training place in the uk so that is uh, for something and that is a uh, not an option which is taken by a lot of people and therefore i did not include it but for all practical purposes mrcp or mrcs is an entry exam onto the specialist path or onto the specialist training pathway and uh, the frcp frcs Uh, is the exit exam which signifies that you have finished your training you have achieved that level of competence and now you can become a consultant it's like that okay. okay so once when we complete this mrcp or mrc when we crack this exam once we clear this exam we will be posted into some re residencies in how to select sir like we have as you told you have four colleges so yes. is it our selection or is it like uh, that selection will be done by you before you apply because you will be applying to a particular college so you will be applying to royal college of england uh, surgeons england or royal college of surgeons of uh, ireland or whatever to give your mrcs so uh, all of those are all the four colleges are absolutely equal they conduct the exam which is the same and all of them are equally recognized through the length and breadth of uk so actually it does not make a difference and uh, you can basically join any of these and is it uh, compulsory to complete that course of residency uh, after joining or like after selecting a college like uh, mm -hmm. only after completing that course of residency we will be provided with the degree is it uh, that way or once we crack itself we are given with no, that see, mrc when you uh, when you clear the exam you are awarded with the title of mrcs which is member of royal college along with that comes your gnc registration which you will have to do it makes you eligible for gnc registration and then you can enter the surgical training pathway or for mrcp the physician or the medicine training pathway then you have to achieve your few years of training followed by that what you can give is your frcp or frcs yes sir so dr namrata has asked one question like uh, since uh, in our country we have a lot of cases and uh, patient load is also vast uh staying back in india will improve our clinical skills more than uh, going for abroad uh one second i'm just reading in the chat box sir staying back in india improve your clinical skills since we get to see a lot of cases and the patient load is vast now this is a um, basically what i would say is this is a uh, unidimensional question which means that um, the 
the person was asked this question what you are thinking is that um, clinical skills is proportional to patient load which is true no doubt no doubt clinical the building of clinical skills is proportional to patient load but that's not the only factor which factors in upon your clinical learning you also need to have number one um, a good amount of um, protocols and sops and things like that which means that apart from just clinical learning what is important is clinical decision making and uh, clinical running of clinical management which is something which is different across countries and more importantly different across branches second is of course what you require is the load of the specific kind of patients for example uh, in the case of surgical branches i have finished my surgical residency from uh, pune maharashtra india and uh, we have had a good amount of clinical exposure i am very very happy and grateful to my institute which has given me that kind of clinical exposure at the same time if you were to be in a department where uh, it is a non surgical it's a medical department then the kind of patients you are getting are proportional or they are a uh, slice of the society in which you are living so in a place like india you will get a lot of tuberculosis you will get a lot of uh, say infectious disease so on and so forth which you may not get in a country which is say us or uk where they will have more of degenerative diseases they will have more of vasculitis so on and so forth so you will develop your clinical skills proportional to what you commonly see over here but you will miss out on things which are not common and the same applies to doing your pg anywhere in the world you will be very proficient at what is what you are encountering most commonly over there and uh, you will be a little less proficient at what is less common over there so that is how these things go i mean that i think that's the answer i can give to that question yes sir thank you so much and one more question uh, from a participant is like uh, since uh, we are all uh, from uh, indian mandian graduate after completing for your final mbbs and also completing our internship uh, is the clinical skill which we acquired in our setup is uh, sufficient to just attend that uh, oski or, or whatever examination uh, which is a part of lab those are two different clinical skills actually because um, uh, the oski does not directly ask you about things like you know um uh, intravenous cannulation and things like that what they are going to ask you is a set of scenarios so there could be a scenario on um breaking the bad news or talking to patients about patient or patient's relatives about someone who is deteriorated or uh talking to uh someone about a surgical complication or taking a consent or things like that so in some cases yes what we are doing will help out in some cases it's entirely new so you will basically have to prepare from the oski point of view separately as well it is not the entire internship uh, set of clinical skills which is uh, come up surely some clinical skills which you are learning in internship will help you out and some you will have to learn afresh or learn new so yeah it's partially helpful partially some things have to be learned by new okay sir thank you and last but not least only one doubt is like uh, since uh, we have prepared for our university exams and we are preparing for the neat pg also how exactly different is this neat pg and uh, in terms of neat pg and this lab or any foreign exam uh, foreign exams uh, in terms of our preparation so is there any uh, your tips or strategy to be followed in exactly preparing for these two again uh, as we said i hope Uh, maybe in a matter of a year i'll be in the position to talk about it but on a general principle the subjects are similar the part 1 exams also have an mcq pattern it is the kind of questions which we have to get used to so surely mbbs graduates will find the content very familiar and you will find that the concepts are also things which you have been learning throughout your mbbs but uh, the format of questions and the type of questions which are asked can vary and so little bit of preparation along those lines will be required yes sir thank you so much sir for this wonderful awesome. session